And how are we doing today? There we go. That's better. It's not two claps and a Ric Flair, but we're going to have a good time, aren't we? So, hey, my name is Aaron. I get to be the location pastor here at Real Life Church, and I want to say thank you for being here today. And uh, I look forward to walking us through and continuing this series, Proverbs. And uh, if you've taken something from this series that's encouraged you or that's meant a lot to you or something that you never really realized or learned just yet, I want to encourage you to take an intentional step uh, over the next couple of weeks. Whether it's a proverb that we've studied, uh, whether in life groups or on Sunday morning, or it's one that you've studied in your extra time, or just a point or an instruction, something you've taken from one of the messages over the last several weeks. If you turn the corner and go right as you exit the auditorium here, uh, on that back wall by the cafe, by Momentum, there's a vinyl that's up. And it's just the opportunity, it says the way of the wise under it. It's an opportunity for you to share something that spoke to your heart over the last couple of weeks. And so I think there's a, a tie that truly happens whenever we write write something down and we're intentional about writing it down. It's why I'm someone that says, hey, take notes, uh, take a notebook out, write it down. There's just an, an, an extra layer of connection uh, for something to resonate and stick in our brains, I feel like. But if you go out there, write it on a sticky note, put it up on that wall here in a couple of weeks, we'll let people begin to go and take some of those that they may be needing to take home with them, to speak to them in whatever season of life they find themselves in. Uh, but today we're going to be in Proverbs chapter four. But before we get into that, I want you guys to do me a favor. And uh, I am someone that is a person that appreciates honor and definitely wants to show honor. I believe God uh, truly means it when he honors honor. And so October is Pastor Appreciation Month. Last week was Pastor Appreciation Week. If you would do me the favor, would you let our staff and our team know at some point this week uh, that you appreciate them? Just tell them thank you, get them a gift, whatever fits your personality the best, and just let them know that you're acknowledging them and all that they do. Uh, our ch- staff does incredible things and does all they can to make sure these Sunday experiences, these, the Wednesday experiences, stuff in the middle of the week and pastoral things uh, go without a hitch. And uh, so whether it's Miss Kim, it is Jennifer Kirby, Miss Judy that helps us all out. It's Stephanie. Um, let me just tell you something about Stephanie real quick. With Trey and Bailey leading those two songs today, would you give it up for them today as they stepped out and led those moments? So good. Watching Stephanie let other people step out in front and lead. And then, of course, Pastor Vince and Jennifer and all that they do. Pastor Vince, he's actually hanging out over in Real Life Kids uh, today. So that's one thing I love about our church and our team is that, hey, we're going to jump in. Um, We're not just siloed ministry mindset. This is what I do here and how I do it. Uh, We are about the gospel and do all that we can. So just as much as it it matters for Pastor Vince to stand up here and preach for you all, It means just as much to him to stand in our kids' ministry and deliver something to them and the investment that 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 is. And so I appreciate who they are as leaders in our team. Let them know. I'll take a compliment any day of the week. I'm a words of affirmation and gifts person. So just slide that in there um, just so you know. Uh, But if you do that for me, let them know that you appreciate them and all that they do as we look to do that during Pastor Appreciation Month uh, this October. Uh, But today I want us to lean into guarding what matters most. Protecting what matters most in our life. Um, There are probably some of you in the room today that have things in your life that have significant value and they are placed, locked away somewhere in your home in a safe. They're buried in a coffee can in the backyard. They are put in a safety deposit box at the bank. Um, But the things that we value are the things that we protect. Uh, There is a basketball card in our home that is hidden, that is stored away, that's locked up, that's kept safe because it has a high, high value. It's not even mine. It's my son's. He's six years old and he probably has the thing of most value in our home. So we've got it stashed away. We've got it protected um, because it's going to pay for college one day, just so you know. And uh, but when we look at the things that we guard and protect in our life, in order to protect it, we first have to recognize and appreciate that there is value tied to it. If there's not any value to it, then what's the point in guarding it or protecting it? And so I got, I got these two simple things that I want you to look at for a second. And you're, we live where the water's near, so we're gonna be familiar with what they are. But as we get into the lesson today, into the message today, what are these that I'm holding right here? Life jackets. Now they both serve the same purpose, but they serve them in different ways a little bit. If we were going out, how many of you are like, when I go on the water, I'm like, I'm not wearing a life jacket. Like, I, I don't need it. I don't want it. Same here. We've been, on the lake, we've been lived here for five years. And we've been on the lake one time, but I don't need a life jacket. So, uh, but that's not the point. If you were going to choose 
which one you were going to wear, which one would you choose? Most of us would choose this one. It's a little more comfortable. It's a little more ideal. It is a life preserver. Same as this, but this one's a little bit more like dire situation. Like if you are in the body of water and you are struggling and you need saving, this is the one that people would throw to you. You throw it over your head, you got it on, you buckle it and you're good. Some of you are like, they needed those on the Titanic. <laughs> well, some things just don't work out the way we thought they would. But this one you can throw on real quick and it's going to save your life or you're going to hope it saves your life. And you could wear it, but if you're swimming, like you jump off the, the pontoon boat, you jump off the roof of it, some of you crazies like me, uh, this isn't the one that you're putting on. You are going to pick and you're going to wear this one because it's more comfortable. It's more ideal to the situation you find yourself in, but you have to be intentional. It's going to be little, okay? Don't laugh at me, all right? It's small. I'm a big guy. It's hard to find stuff that fits sometimes. You got to take it and you have to put it on, but not only do you have to put it on, but you have to buckle it so that it serves its purpose. Some of them you zip up, you got, you get, your kids got the ones, you got the buckle, the strap that goes between the legs. But now I know that if I jump in the water, I am going to be protected because I believe that my life is valuable. And so I want us to walk through this idea today of what parts of our life are valuable. What is the most valuable part of our life? Because your life is valuable. Some of you may be in the room today or watching online and thinking, you know what? I, I don't know if my life's valuable. I don't know if I believe that my life is worth living. And let me just tell you before we get into anything else today, don't let the enemy tell you that lie because you absolutely have value in this world and God placed you here for purpose and a call and he desires your heart beyond all things. So today we get into this Proverbs chapter four, verse 23. Before we get into this, this section of Proverbs that we're diving into, these first nine chapters, Pastor Vince has mentioned it, is King Solomon giving instruction and direction and wisdom to his son. So he's sharing life experience and he's telling you, hey, I, these are some of the things I've learned. These are some of the things I've watched. These are things I've observed and I need you to get a hold of them right now because your future is what's ahead of you. And I want us to be intentional about what you're learning, what you're gonna walk into. Because in this, in guarding our heart, every decision we make stems from the heart and where our heart is, is where our future will be. And if you look at, at this, even like the fir these first 20 verses in this chapter, he's like, hey, I need you to listen to me. I need you to catch this. I'm not just sitting down here giving you instruction just so I can feel good, but I, I want you to learn. How many of you have a season or have been in a season in life where there's someone sharing with you or you sharing with kids like, hey, I know I've told you this time and time again, but I need you to get this. Like, I really need you to listen because I don't want you to make the same mistakes that I made. I don't want you to be in the same hurt that we've experienced. I don't want you to go down the same path our family's been in. I don't want you to be around the people that, that are, are gonna destroy your life. I need you to listen right now to what I'm saying so that I can instruct you and be intentional about what I'm preparing you for. He's being intentional about the generation that's following because if we're, everything that we do is a lesson that's being learned by the generation behind us. Everything we do is a lesson being learned by the generation that's behind us. So we have to be intentional on teaching the lesson. And so in this, it says in Proverbs chapter four, verse 23, it says, keep your heart with all vigilance for from it flow the springs of what? Life. Keep your heart with all vigilance for from it flows the springs of life. So now we need to know the significance of what the heart looks like in this text. See, the heart isn't just something in the Bible that is just flippantly thrown around. There is actually in the Old Testament alone over 800 references to the heart. If something's referred to over 800 times, it's probably significant, is it not? Some of you are thinking like, I'm already thinking about what you said about teaching a lesson over and over again, just hoping I get it. Like, I feel like that's what the Old Testament's trying to do sometimes. Like 800 times, this is about your heart. I need you to get this. This is about your heart. Your heart is important. I need you to get this. This is about your heart. And some of you feel like that, whether it's a boss that you have or it's a person that's investing into you or it's you raising your kids, you're like, I need you to pay attention. For the 798th time, I need you to listen to me. 
For the 799th time, I need you to listen to me. For the 800th time, I want you to recognize that your heart is valuable. Not only is it 800 times in the Old Testament, but it's 91 times in the book of Proverbs alone. And so when we think of the heart, a lot of times we think of the emotional connection to what we experience in life. But that's not what the Bible is looking at. It's like that, the emotional connection to the heart was actually introduced later on by the Greeks. When it came into the Hellenization of God's people and introducing new ideas and new concepts. So this, this idea of feeling in your heart came from a totally different culture that was trying to pervert the direction of God's people. And so what God is talking about when we lean into the Old Testament and your heart, he is talking about the thing that is leading your life every single day, that it is who you are. And so to guard it above all things, it says this in Matthew 15, 18 through 20. It says, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this is what defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. And so what is in your heart absolutely matters because it is what's going to be what comes out of it. Every decision you make, every decision you make that sets within your heart is a vote for what you want your future to look like. And so I'm going to walk through three things today, three areas of our life that I feel like it is most common for us to need to be guarding our heart. There are many, many ways and many, many things we need to guard our heart in, but I'm going to walk through three simple principles today. And the first is this, is to guard your heart in your thoughts. Guard your heart in your thoughts. Well, how does that even connect? How does that even make sense? I mean, my mind's here, my heart's here. There's two different things. Well, what you think about matters. What do you think about matters? And, and this gets into some New Testament things. We can even get into the scientific side of it. The scientific side of it is neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity means that you can retrain the way your brain functions and operates and thinks. It says this in, in Proverbs 23, 7, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. So the things that you are thinking are rooted from what's taking place in your heart. And so we see this kind of connection though here, that what I feel is what I think upon. What I experience is what I think upon. What I see around me is what I think upon. And so what is in our heart is what we think about. And neuroplasticity is the connection of our memory to what we felt in a moment. You can retrain the way you think. We have a book out front. I don't know if we have any more today, but we can order some if you're interested. It's, and it's by Craig Rochelle. It's winning the war within your mind. And neuroplasticity is the things that you remember, the things that you recall, those moments in your life are directly tied to an emotion that you felt. So one of the easiest examples is this, is the moment that you first saw pornography, whether you're male or female, the connection you felt to that moment. And then from there, the guilt, the shame that took place every day. Every time, like pornography is something where you turn to it hoping to feel some kind of satisfaction, but it is actually a sexually traumatic experience that leaves you feeling worse on the other side of it. Maybe it's death. Maybe it's the first time you felt an experience lost. You know what it felt like in that moment. Maybe it's the season of uncertainty in your life and you begin to doubt the things that are happening around you. You're doubting the choices. You're doubting the direction. You're doubting God. You remember the feelings that you experienced in those moments. But if you begin to think about those things differently, you begin to engage in things differently, it'll begin to produce different results in your life in the way that you think. If you wanna be different, you wanna look different, you wanna do different, you have to first think different. And Paul talks about this in several different ways. In 1 Corinthians, he says, to take every thought captive. Well, what does that mean? How many of you are a whole lot better 
at reacting in a moment than responding in a moment. Don't have to raise your hands. Don't have to nudge people. Let me, let me explain to you what I'm talking about. A lot of times we live it like the world we live in is a world of reaction. Like as soon as I f- take something in, as soon as I hear something, as soon as I see something, I immediately have to react to what's taking place and give input to what's happening rather than truly responding. Responding is a healthy process of how to engage in the next step. You receive the information, you process it, you think about it, you try to at least understand it, and then you can provide a response rather than just a reaction. You think about how to handle things differently rather than just reacting to what your spouse just did or didn't do, rather than just reacting in the moment to how your kids handled that situation, rather than just reacting to that coach or to that boss, you're responding and you'll be able to, 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 to think differently in the situation. Maybe, maybe we look at the, the circumstance in our life or the problem, and rather than looking at the problem, we look at the opportunity to overcome something where we can see God exemplified and glorified in the struggle every day. Well, I, mean, I don't want to go to work or oh, I don't want to do this or I don't want to handle or this shouldn't be happening. Okay, well, what if we turn to God and say, God, what is the opportunity that I can take advantage of today where you will be glorified in it rather than just me whining about the struggle that I'm in? Maybe what if we begin to empower people and encourage people and speak life into people rather than just being another person in the world that speaks death upon them? You see, Jesus is someone that, that served, like he was about people. But yet so many times, even as Christians, we're like, you know what? I don't even like people. I don't want to be around people. Like they hurt, they're damaging, they, they discourage, all those things. Well, here's the deal. They don't know what they don't know. Like we are in a hurting, lost and broken world. And we're to be the ones to be the example. So we have to engage with people if we want to see people's lives changed. So rather, rather than just rolling through the highlight reel of, well, they have that boat and I have this boat. Their kids get to do that and my kids are stuck doing this. They make this much money and I make this little money. We compare all the time. And rather than going through a comparison mindset, what if we just served and we encouraged and we empowered the people around us? And when you begin to serve and encourage and empower the people around you, you'll begin to look at yourself even differently. Because so many times in our life, what we're searching for it's based on our circumstances. And what we really want is happiness. Like the world says day in and day out, hey, just do what makes you happy. And that is a trap set by the enemy because happiness is based on everything circumstantial. Everything that happens around. I'll tell you, yesterday we were watching, we watched football all day. We watched baseball last night. And when the OU game was happening, I wasn't very happy. But when the Yankees won last night, I was really happy, okay? Like there is a big difference because it's based on the circumstances of what we find ourselves in. And we settle so many times for just wanting the emotion or the feeling of happy when God truly wants us to have a lifestyle that reflects joy. And joy is a fruit of the spirit. In Galatians chapter five, it says to set your heart on these things, that these are the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, gentleness, Those are the things that are a reflection of who Jesus is in us. Too many times we walk around thinking, you know what? I I think I need this, or I think I want that, or I think I want a relationship with them, or I think I want to experience that. I think I want to go do this. I think I want to go work there. I think I need to make this much money. I think I need to do that. And it's all based on feeling and circumstances rather than be like, I'm going to choose joy in whatever circumstance I find myself in. Because wherever I find myself, I know that he sits on the throne. Wherever I find myself, I know that he will provide. Wherever I find myself, I know that I am a child of God. And it doesn't matter what anybody else says about me. I know that I am his and he is mine. So if we choose joy rather than searching for happiness, our thought process will begin to transform. We begin to think your brain is a muscle. And you can begin to train it and think the way that you desire it to think, to renew your mind daily is what it says in Romans. So if we, w- we want to guard our heart and our thoughts so that we may think the ways of Christ, that his thoughts are our thoughts and his ways be our ways. What would that then lead into? 
Well, if you begin to think differently, it's going to do this. It's going to change the way that you function in your workplace and you guard your heart in your work. So we guard our heart in our thoughts and then we guard our heart in our work because how you work is how you worship. See, how many of us in the room today, you don't have to raise your hands, but you are absolutely dreading going to work tomorrow on Monday morning. Some of you may even have to go this evening. You're like, I really don't want to do this. Let's let's talk about changing that mindset again a little bit. Do you realize that God created work? In the, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, he spoke it all into existence. And then he created Adam and he gave Adam responsibilities and tasks to fulfill. He gave him work to do. He gave him a purpose to name the animals, to work the fields, to take care of the livestock, all these things. He gave him responsibilities. He gave him work. And then he created someone to do that along with him and Eve. But in that, it all got messed up when the fall took place. So what was once an opportunity where God gave us purpose and gave us something to do and to accomplish and to achieve in work is now even distorted and perverted in the world because we don't want to go to work. It's just another thing that we have to do, an obligation we have to in order to make ends meet and make things take place in our lives so that we can provide. But what if we realize that work is an opportunity, that work is a blessing, and there are some people around us that would do anything. They are waiting on a phone call day after day, hoping someone will call them to give them a job, hoping that they can show up, that they can provide for their family, hoping that there's something out there that they can take a next step. But then there's so many of us that are like, you know what, I really, really don't want to go and do this because we find our value in what we do rather than in who we are. And what we do a lot of times is we take worship, which the Bible says in all things work in a way that glorifies and honors God. So the way that you work in your workplace is the way that you worship. It's how people see Christ in you. And we turn our worship and we add one letter in the middle of it. And our worship becomes workship. And we care more about what we do in our vocation and what our title is rather than who God has called and created us to be. And we're more intentional with getting a job done or getting a paycheck than we are with being an, an actual Christ follower. And become a workaholic. And now, again, the way you work absolutely reflects how you worship. Because what if you did this tomorrow? Let me just give you a test for whenever you walk back into wherever you work, whether it's a school, it's a store, it's a hospital, it's an office, wherever you might be, wherever you might work, or maybe you're a student, the way you walk into a classroom, when you walk into work tomorrow, what do people in the room do when you walk in? Do they get more excited? Do they get engaged? Do they, are, they, are they excited that you are there, that you bring something to the table? Do they begin to turn the other direction? You can begin to see that maybe you're the element in the room that think, makes things off kilter. How do people respond to your presence in the room when you walk into work? And then you'll be able to properly reflect on the way that you work, the way that you worship. Because there's a reality to the first example of Jesus that some people are going to see is how you are in the workplace. How do you respond to your, your boss when they give a task that may not align with the process that you think it should be handled? How do you handle the people at work that are a little more annoying? Are you talking about them at the water cooler with everyone else just as they are? Or maybe you, or are you the one that's saying, you know what, why don't we encourage them? Why don't we, maybe they're going through something difficult and we just don't understand what's taking place in their life. The way that we carry ourselves in work is an example of the way that we worship God. So you walk in tomorrow, measure that. Let's jump to Thursday. What if you did this on Thursday? You know, Monday happens. Monday's Monday, Tuesday's Tuesday, Wednesday's Wednesday. Thursday, it's almost Friday. So Thursday afternoon, you walk up to a coworker and you say, hey, I would love for you to go to church with me on Sunday morning. Why don't you come sit with me at Real Life Church? What would their reaction be? Would it be, oh, I, I, I didn't even know you went to church. I didn't realize you went to church. Or would it be gratitude because, hey, you, you extended an invitation, you were intentional with an invite towards them. They might tell you no, and you can just invite them again the next week. But what would their reaction be to if you were intentional about inviting them to church? Would they see it in your everyday life that you were a person of love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control? 
Or would you be someone that they're like, oh, like, but the way you handled the situation earlier this morning, I, I didn't, I wouldn't have thought that you're a person that goes to church. And not just a person that goes to church, but that claims to be a Christian. It's like what Pastor Vince said last week. It's like, I'm not watching just on Sunday mornings with the hands going up. I want to see how you interact with the people that are around you. So it's not just something you believe, but it's how you behave. If people were watching you intentionally, which they are, because everything you do is a lesson being taught to someone around you. How would they handle that? How would they respond to that if you were intentional with an invite to church? Some of us, that's why we don't invite people to church. It's because we think we can separate the two. We can say, you know what? I'm going to live my work life here. I'm going to live my church life here. And they don't have to commingle. Well, that, you know what? That means your heart is not fully committed and fully invested in giving to God. Because you got a work heart and you got a, you got a, a, a home heart and you got a, a church heart and you got a heart that's divided is a heart that is not even devoted. And so when we look at where we work, maybe it's your, with your kids. Do your kids recognize that they are more valuable than your work? Well, if I, if I spend a couple extra hours, that'll give us a couple extra dollars and then they'll get to do that. Do you really think that a couple extra dollars is going to make a difference in what is they're looking at in the long run of their future? And I'm not saying there aren't seasons where we got to be more intentional and more committed to our work to make things happen because issues do happen. Things happen. I understand that. I see it. But when it comes to the consistency and the fruit of what your children are seeing, is what you do at work more important than what you do at home? See, Solomon right now in this text, he is the king. You don't think he has stresses. You don't think he has responsibilities. You don't think he has things to be thinking about, but he's saying, hey, my son, I need you to recognize that I'm going to be intentional with teaching you some things. And one of these things is that you need to guard your heart because from your heart is all of life. So how do you, how do you guard your heart in your work? Is it the opportunity that you get to serve and you get to worship and God begins to provide for your family? Or is it the thing that brings agony and torture to your life? What if we thought about it in a little bit different way? What if our heart towards work looked a little bit different? So we guard our heart and our thoughts. We guard our heart in our, in our work. And the third is probably the most common area that we see this text used in. And it's to guard your heart in our relationships. So when we look at creation and you see that God created everything and then he created Adam and then he gave him responsibility in the text, but he gave someone to him to do it all with. You know, we, we say it almost every single week here at Real Life Church that we are better together. It's a value that we have because we truly believe and you can see the evidence in the fact that you cannot do life alone or you will self-destruct and fall into a pit of despair. You have to have people around you that are going with you, that are walking with you, that are encouraging you, that are on mission with you. And some of you are saying, well, I, I am so guarded and protected in my relationships because every time I give my heart to someone, they just leave it in pieces and broken. That's not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about guarding your heart. Because what that is, that's, that's protecting your heart. That's putting razor wire around it where nobody else can get in. And there are certain people that, that God wants in your life, but first you have to let him into your heart to begin to restore and heal relationships. How you view relationships. Because you maybe have left season after season in relationship after relationship, friendship after friendship. Maybe it's even in your family with your parents or people around you where you've experienced broken relationships. But here's the deal, people cannot break what they are not given. See, this is, this is why heartbreak happens is because instead of putting our, our full value and our full heart first in Jesus and letting him lead in our relationships, we take our heart that is so fragile and full of emotion and we hand it to someone and we expect a human to be able to care for it and hold on to it the way that Jesus desires to. And hurt people hurt people, broken people break things and so when we leave things in human hands, 
it's going to get broken. But we say, God, I want you, that relationship with you to matter first. If your relationship with God is the first and foremost thing, then he will begin to put the relationships around you that you need. It may not be a dating or a marriage first. It may be a mentor that can truly encourage you and help you to heal in the next steps. And maybe just be good people and good friends to be around. It may be a life group. It may, I don't, I don't know what it is in your seed in the life, but if you trust God with your heart and your relationship be focused on him first, then he will put the proper relationships around you. Because the way that you handle your relationships first is the way that you look at yourself. So if you don't value yourself, you're not gonna value people around you. If you don't recognize that God beyond all things, creator of all things, values you so much that he died on the cross for your sins to give you life and life more abundantly to conquer whatever it is that you may be facing in your life, that he has already done it and he loves you and values you that much. If you can't look in the mirror and say that my God loves me, you're not gonna be able to show that love to relationships around you. You see what, what happens a lot of times as you see in Matthew chapter seven, verse six, again, you have to, if, you, if it's valuable, you're gonna guard it. It says this, do not give dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Quit giving your heart the thing that is most valuable to just anybody and everybody that's around you the first person that shows you affection, the first person that shows you some kind of value, the first person that shows you appreciation, the first person that shows you time investment. Quit giving your heart, quit giving your heart the thing of most value to the things with the easiest access. Because what that'll leave us doing time and time again, it'll be say, leave us calling and say, God, I need you to save me again. God, I need you to get me out of this situation again. God, I, I feel like I'm drowning. And if I could just get this over my head and you'll save me again. He's saying, I wanna do more than just save you. I wanna protect you. I wanna heal you. I wanna restore you. But unless you let me into your heart first, I cannot do that. And so your relationship with him is what matters first and foremost for your heart to be the thing that can be properly cared for and guarded so that you can properly learn how to love and encourage people around you in a relationship. Why would anybody want a relationship with you if you don't even want a relationship with yourself? And so God is saying, he says in the Bible that God's a gentleman, that he waits at the door and he knocks. He doesn't just barge in and say, hey, I'm here and I'm gonna fix everything. This little part over here, this decision you made, we're gonna, we're gonna tweak this here. And then this part of you that was broken and traumatic from your, from your childhood, we're gonna, we're gonna begin to process through that. And this darkness that you feel when you're alone, we're gonna, I'm gonna be here, I'm gonna be present for you. Like, that's not how he does it. He sits and he says, hey, I'm right here. And everything that you need, I am. But I need you to make the choice to let me in first. So the brokenness that you feel, let me in and I'll heal it. The, the hurt, the angst, the, the struggle, the addiction, let me, let me walk in and I'll break those chains. The doubt, the death, those things, let me carry all that, but I am here, but I need you to let me in first. But so many of us have the razor wire rather than saying, God, let me just open this gate for you and I'm gonna let you in and I'm gonna let you work. Because it says this in, in, in Ezekiel 3, 26. It says, and I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. So I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. So that heart that we carry so often that's, that's dark, it's depressed, it's got insecurities, it's been trampled on, We've thrown it to the dogs and it's been chewed on. It's been stepped on by the pigs. And what we've got, we've made, I made this decision. I did those things and, and I, got, I got this struggle and I've got this financial problem. And I got all these things that are stirring in our heart. Jesus is saying I, that heart that is yours, that has all those issues in it, I still want it. 
Like, I, I love you so much that I wanna take that heart and I wanna give you a new one that reflects me. To take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender and responsive heart. Ephesians 3, 17 says that, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. John 7, 38 says, whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Oh, that's in John, that's in the New Testament. What did we start with? Oh, Proverbs 4, 23, keep your heart with all vigilance. From, from it flows the springs of life. So if our heart reflects the heart of God, if our heart is truly given to Christ and it is guarded by him, we walk with him in, in, our, in our thoughts and in our work, in our relationships, in our finances, in everything that we face in our circumstances, we can say, God, I'm gonna choose joy in these moments and not just chase the fleetingness of happiness. From there will flow rivers of life. So the opposite is, if our heart isn't truly guarded and truly committed to Christ, then from it will flow death and demise. From out of the heart, the mouth speaks. What you ingest, what you take in, what you consume is what will come out. So we just can't walk through life without being intentional and saying, God, I wanna make sure that I am spending time with you so that I know your heart and my heart can be a reflection of your heart. Guarding our heart isn't just continually calling out, saying, God, I know you got me, come and save me. It's being intentional saying, God, I'm with you. And because I'm with you, I know you got me. So today with every head bowed and every eye closed, my first question is this, maybe today you never said yes to fully committing your heart, your life to Jesus. You're saying it's broken, it's shattered, it's everybody's had my heart except for Jesus. It's dark, it's dirty, it's depressing. Well, he still wants it because only he can restore it. And so if that's you today and you're saying, I wanna know more about this Jesus, I wanna make a decision to follow him. I wanna give him my life. I wanna give him my heart. And these altars up front, they're open and someone will be here to pray with you. They wanna answer questions that you have. They wanna encourage you. They wanna walk with you. They will not leave you alone. So if that's you today, feel free to make your way to the front. But for everybody else in the room today, maybe it's you, you're not very intentional in how you guard your thoughts. Maybe it's the separation of work and worship rather than worship in your work. Maybe it's your relationships, whether it's home, it's family, it's friends, it's, it's dating and marriage that you just let anybody have your heart. So without anyone looking in the room today, if you're saying, hey, Aaron, I need to be more intentional with how I guard my heart and how I let Jesus lead me. I need to let him lead me. If that's you in the room today, no one else looking around, I'm just gonna pray for us. Would you just put your hand up, put it right back down. I got you, I got you, I got you. You can put it right back down. Thank you for your transparency. I'm gonna pray for us. But here's the deal too, I'm gonna tell you. Let someone know, someone you trust, someone you know is walking in this kind of way. The person you walk into work or you walk into church say, hey, I see something different and you I wanna show me how to walk through some of these things. Share with them so they can pray with you. So Father, today we thank you. God, we give you all the glory and all the praise, but God, we honor you above all because you are holy. God, and I'm thankful for the fact that we get to be here today in your house to worship you, to lean in and, and to learn. And God, I thank you for every hand that just went up in this place, for that transparency and vulnerability. God, I pray that you be whatever they need in these circumstances. God, if it's peace, if it's comfort, if it's healing, if it's rest, if it's restoration, it's direction. God, that they have the, the, the ability to respond rather than just react. God, that they trust you with every search situation. God, they recognize that their heart is of utmost value to you. God, that we are your most prized possession. God, I pray for the relationships that we have. God, I pray they reflect you. I pray you put people around us for good, healthy, Christ-centered relationships. God, that we walk into our workplace in a way that our, 
our head is held high, our shoulders are back, and we carry ourselves with a stature that glorifies and honors you, that people can see you in us. God, that we take our thoughts captive. God, the things that we take in are reflecting of what comes out of who you are. So God, I pray today that you be with every single one of these people. God, I thank you that we got to be here today. God, I look forward to the week that you have in store for us. God, I pray your blessing, your favor and protection upon them in all things. God, we give you the glory, the honor and the praise in Jesus' name. Everybody say, amen.